Greetings and welcome to worship with the Lakeshore Church in St. Clair Shores, Michigan and wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Pastor Adam and I am so pleased to count you a part of our church. I invite you to stay connected with us, not just here on Sunday mornings, but also throughout the week. Like us on uh, Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, download the Lakeshore Church app and email us at connect at lakeshorechurch.com and we will be sure to get you on our weekly email blast. My friends, we are continuing uh, today in our story on Joseph, and and we're going to hear about just an impossible reunion and how God does impossible things. Uh, I want to share one announcement as we get started, which is uh, tomorrow, uh, starting on Monday, August 1st, we are uh, launching our week of Vacation Bible School, and it's still not too late to sign up. Even though we were, we're basically filled up, but there's room for you, and we invite you to, to, to sign up, and you can do so right on our website, lakeshorechurch.com. We're going to have a great week, and if there's anyone you know who's uh, preschool through fifth grade, uh, let them know that uh, it's going to be good. My friends, uh, let's turn our hearts and minds now over to the worship of God. This morning's worship now begins.
welcome back to yet another installment of the Joseph story. It's getting close to the end, and uh, this is a real exciting passage we've got for you this morning. So this is Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 through 11, and 25 through 28. Here's a continuation of the story. Now Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me here ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and your herds, all that you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all that belong to you will become destitute. So they went up out of Egypt, and they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, and they told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler over all of Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts that Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Saru, a five-year-old boy from India, lived with his mother, older brother, and younger sister. One day, as his brother was heading out to earn some money, Saru begged to come along. His brother finally agreed, but as they got to the train station, Saru was too tired to stay awake. His brother puts him on a bench and tells him to stay there until he returns. Saru falls asleep but when he wakes up, his brother's nowhere to be found. He, he goes searching for him, and he ends up in an empty train car. He curls up and falls asleep again. When he wakes up, the train is moving, and the doors are locked. He's stuck on that train for days, and unbeknownst to him, he ends up in Calcutta, on the other side of the country, almost a thousand miles away. Miraculously, he escapes some ill-fated encounters, and he ends up in the custody of the state. But they're unable to figure out where he came from, and so they deem him to be a lost child. He's adopted by parents in Australia, and that's where he grows up. As he comes of age, though, the the memories of his childhood and the separation from his brother and birth mother, they haunt him. He pictures his mother suffering all through these years, just wondering what had happened to him. He begins to investigate his origins, and after three years of some intense online research, he figures out where he's from. Then he decides to make the pilgrimage, and he returns to his hometown, and he finds that his mother has been waiting for him, hoping against hope for his return. This is a true story, and it's captured in the 2016 film Lion. When I first saw the film, I was so moved. And this past week, I went back and found the reunion scene where Saru and his mother are reunited. I was brought to tears all over again. Happy tears for the triumph of hope. Sad tears for the trials and tribulations that might not have been. Emotional tears 
as I watch this grown son and his mother experience a reunion 25 years in the making. As they set eyes on each other, they were in disbelief. That gave way to expressions of regret, some verification that this was all real, and a breakthrough to unbelievable joy. Now, it's not the shouting, screaming kind of joy. Hey, you know, it's my birthday. It's the hard fought. We've been through the fire, and we've come out to the other side to a place we didn't think possible kind of joy. (laughs) I commend the movie to all of you. And I share about it today because it helped get me in touch with the emotional weight of Joseph's story and this reunion that is experienced between him and the rest of the family. This is an impossible story, especially from Jacob's point of view. Jacob, Joseph's father, he's been in sorrow for 22 years. Sorrow not merely at being separated from his son, but sorrow because he was certain that Joseph was dead. Now, he never saw the body, but his brothers, after selling Joseph into slavery, covered up their evil act and created this whole ruse which tricked their father. They ripped uh, Joseph's robe into pieces, dipped it in animal blood, and, uh, and showed it to their father, leaving him to believe that Joseph had been attacked and killed by a ferocious animal. As Jacob sees his seven sons, uh, seven, sorry, 11 sons returning from Egypt, including his son Benjamin, It's his answer to prayer. (laughs) This is before he knows anything about Joseph. But before they all left, he prayed that God would show him mercy and return his sons, especially Benjamin, to him. (laughs) Little did he know that God's mercy was greater than he dreamed possible. Uh, uh, His son's return is going to include the news that Joseph was alive. That's more mercy than he could have ever thought to pray for. Jacob can't believe it when he hears it. His sons tell him, Joseph is alive and it is against all comprehension. But then they begin to explain it to him. Uh, They add in all of these details. They tell him what Joseph had said to them, them how he wants all of them to come back and live in Egypt, how he's risen to this, this number two position in all of Egypt. And, and, and I don't know if this is the moment that these sons had came clean to their father about what they did to their brother so long ago that they had really been lying to him all these years. I mean, they had to have come clean at some point. And if this is the, good po- the, this is the point where that happens, just the, the, the overall good news <laughs> just, just, just overpowers the past sin that these brothers have committed. Anyhow, Jacob seems to be on the road, <laughs> and and I, I get that uh, you know sometimes such such huge joy just overcomes any wrongdoing. When I was little, my mother told me to hold on to her hand to not let go, but but I let go. I let go to to look at the magazine rack. <laughs> And that caused us to get separated. I don't think it was more than a couple of minutes, but, but to my young self, it seemed like forever. And when my mother finally found me, I was expecting a scolding, but, but there was no scolding, only the loving embrace. And, and Jacob has no time for scolding in the midst of, of news that just overwhelms him with joy. He doesn't believe it at first, but then he sees the riches that accompany this news that his son is alive. Joseph had sent back with his brothers a caravan for his father, included ten donkeys loaded with the very best things of Egypt, and then ten other female donkeys loaded with provisions for the journey. (laughs) Now, if the plan was to bring them all back to Egypt, uh, Jacob and the rest of the family, why does Joseph send things on that we're just going to need to come back (laughs) to Egypt anyway? Uh, Joseph sent all this on because it's the proof Joseph knew that the good news delivered just in words from his brothers was not going to be enough. (laughs) A lie that Jacob had been living for 22 years isn't just going to turn around like that. It's just like 
how Thomas needed to see the resurrected Jesus with his own eyes. He needed to, to touch the wounds in order to believe this impossible news. Jacob needs something too to, to verify what is unbelievable and the, the riches of Egyptian royalty is, is the very verification that makes the impossible news that he was seeing believable. I mean, it had to be true. How else could you explain all of this stuff? And with the details of what the brothers are saying, it's sinking in, and he's overwhelmed. I mean, how is any of this possible? Well, it's possible because of God. If you get news that is just too good to be true, it just may be God's news to you. Now, this is the seventh week we've been engaged with Joseph's story I've tried my best not to jump too quickly to the good news that we're hearing today. Uh, instead, we've been dwelling with Joseph and his suffering and his hardship. We've been trying to take his story as it comes. And if you just happen to be jumping in today, let me just give you the highlights. Out of jealousy and hatred, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Then, in slavery, the wife of his master falsely accuses him of seducing her. That gets him thrown into jail. And then he gets this opportunity. It's about to be a big break, the one that's going to get him out. But, but then the one that he helps forgets about him and fails to repay the kindness that Joseph has shown. He's stuck in prison he suffers a total of 13 years and then by matter of happenstance receives this opportunity which gets him elevated to that number two position in Egypt. Essentially, he has been functioning as Pharaoh. This would have been a Hollywood ending except today it gets even better. It's this glad reunion with his brothers and a father and a son who together discover that the other is alive. It's impossible. It's impossible for Joseph because his father's so old, he's well over 100. And it's impossible for Jacob because he's believed that Joseph is dead. It's just incredible. <laughs> it's taken 22 years for all of this to come back together and to come to fruition. And at no point during Joseph's suffering could anyone see, uh, not even Joseph, he couldn't see how God was working his will to make this all come to be. But, but now that we're here, now that we're here, we can see it. We can see God's hand through all of it. God has done this impossible thing for Joseph, for Jacob, and for the whole family. It's nothing less than a miracle. I don't use that word lightly, but, but it isn't your flashy, kind of in-your-face sort of miracle. It's not the miraculous healing of cancer. It isn't God sending fire down on your enemies. It's not a, a decisive sort of intervention that everyone can point to and say, there is God. But in some ways... It's even more powerful than those sorts of things. This miracle it is only possible because of a series of events that for in order to happen, we, we, we have to acknowledge that, that it's because God has been there at every part of the story. He's been there directing things at every turn. I mean, it's either that or or an impossible coincidences of, of chance. <laughs> but Joseph articulates the faith, the faith that this has been God's doing all along. Uh, Joseph doesn't take on a victim mentality, even though he's one that has been victimized. He sees himself in all of it as God's servant. And as he talks to his brothers, Three times Joseph proclaims, God sent me. He, he says, God sent me before you to preserve your life. He, he said, God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant. He, he says, it's not you who sent me, but God. His brothers may have 
toppled that first domino when they sold Joseph into slavery, the, the, the move that then began the, the whole story. That uh, began this series of events that now have led us back to this point. Uh, but the brothers didn't direct any of this. Uh, Joseph hasn't been able to direct any of this. God in his power has done it. Now, I'm not saying God caused the brothers to sin. God doesn't ever direct us to sin. But, but God was somehow mysteriously present as his brothers mistreated him, as Potiphar's wife framed him, as he suffered in prison. Uh, just as sure as we can say God was present as Joseph was elevated by Pharaoh, as he encountered his brothers, and when they found forgiveness, repentance, and reconciliation together that made this reunion possible, that is making it possible for them all with their father to start a new life together. Joseph's words to his brothers, you sold me, but God sent me, raises the challenging question about the relationship between human responsibility and divine sovereignty. When people make bad decisions, when they sin, when they fail, we, we can see that. But how God is in the middle of that, that's more elusive. How God is working his will out, well, that's not usually so obvious. <laughs> especially in the midst of sin, because sin separates us from God. Uh, sin takes us far away from God, but sin cannot stop God in his sovereignty. For 20 years, Joseph couldn't see a scrap of evidence that God was going to work his suffering for this kind of good. Any hope for this kind of reconciliation with his family, it must have been unthinkable. But now, Suddenly, God's faithfulness shines brightly into the darkness of this family's hard and difficult past. It's incredible. But exactly how God worked to do all this is mystery. Uh, Gary Inrig, in his book, God's Mysterious Ways, discusses a distinction between puzzles and mysteries. He attributes the, the thought to Austin Farrar. Puzzles are problems that are usually resolved by gathering more information. When we think of books and movies under the genre of mysteries, uh, what they actually are more precisely puzzles. See, through the unfolding of a story, we find clues that the author has gathered uh, and given to us along the way. And finally, after pulling all of the pieces together for us, we are led to a resolution as we discover who's done it, how they did it, and with what? A mystery, on the other hand, lies beyond the realm of information, beyond the realm of facts. It can't be solved by gathering more information because it transcends the limits of our intelligence and our capacity to discern ultimate reality, at least on this side of the grave. The only way to unravel a divine mystery is from a revelation that comes from God. Without that direct revelation, full explanation is just beyond our reach. Maybe we can, we can take stabs at it, get glimpses of it, but, but these mysteries, they stretch the limits of our imagination and they take us to places beyond human possibility. When Joseph proclaims to his brothers, you sold me, but God sent me, he is speaking a great mystery. But it's not irrational. It's not crazy. <laughs> we proclaim, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. By faith, we know it's true. It is the fulfillment of the dream which Joseph was given at 17. A God-given dream. It was divine revelation. And he told it to his brothers. He told his brothers that he was going to be master and lord over them. And here he is. But 22 years later, we discover that he is a servant lord. And he may be over his brothers, but he's there to provide, to provide for his whole family. Uh, it turns out to be a different kind of vision than probably Joseph even thought it was when he was 17 years old. As people of faith, we hold that God is breaking into this world, breaking into this world to do things that are not possible 
We have to be open. We have to be ready for this. We have to be ready for how God is in and acting in the world beyond our ability to comprehend him. Now being open to God doing the impossible, <laughs> it's, not, it's not about praying and wishing for the impossible. I think often that's the way we think about this stuff. We think, hey, hey, with God anything is possible, and God, I need you to do this, I want you to do this, will you please do this? Say, heal me from uh, a terminal illness or from disease. <laughs> when we are asking for that kind of prayer, we're asking for a miracle, we're asking God to do what we want God to do, and nothing wrong with that, and God uh, does answer our prayers, sometimes even with uh, the sort of miracles that uh, we're asking for. But I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about here is entering into a life of trust, that God is directing things, that God is working things out, Then, even in the midst of sin and suffering and pain, God's providence will prevail and will be better than anything we can even imagine, better than anything we can even pray for. It's, It's beyond our wildest comprehension. These are real miracles when we are able to look back and and see that God's done something for us that we never even could have asked for. This sort of trust is how we begin to live in eternity even here and now. Yeah, the most powerful miracles are the ones beyond imagination. It's the things God is directing that we can't even think of for ourselves. But then, then it happens. The impossible happens. The thing that you don't even think possible, that doesn't even make sense, that news which is too good to be true, but since it is true, we realize it must be God's news for you. May we all in our life get a good dose of God's news. And may you hear in your life right now, whatever you may be facing, may you be open to just such a reality. And may God's providence and sovereignty be with us all. Amen.
My friends, as we talk about uh, trusting in God's uh, sovereignty and, and providence in our lives, uh, God also encourages us and, and tells us, pray, pray for that which you need, for that which you want, for your heart's desire. And, and as we pray, God will surely listen uh, to our prayers. And however he answers them, <laughs> we trust in his ever never failing love. And I want to invite you to, to let your request be known, uh, not just to God, but also to us, because we want to join you in praying for uh, whatever need or concern you have in your life. We, we're also happy to celebrate joys. If you're online right now, you can uh, just put it right into the chat, a concern or a joy that you have, and uh, we'll, we'll turn these all over to God. If you want to email us at prayer at lakeshoreschurch.com, we can also include your uh, prayers here in uh, our, our, our prayer team's prayers for this week ahead. Um, uh, if you need someone to pray with you, uh, we're also uh, standing by to, to enter into prayer uh, and relationship with you. We would love uh, to know uh, what's going on in your life and how we can come beside you and, and, and seek God's presence in whatever life experiences you are going through right now. My friends, God also invites us to pray the way that his son taught us. So let us come together and share in that prayer together. Will you say it with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, hey, everyone. It's been another fantastic service worshiping together again. And, and I just love this part of the Joseph story, the part where, where Joseph says, hey, you know what? This was God's plan. You guys thought you were doing something horrible to me, but God had a greater plan. God had a greater plan to bring to fulfillment because I was faithful. What a, what a lesson we can learn. What a message that we can all certainly take to heart of being faithful to God, even when it seems like it's at its darkest. We can learn so much from this Joseph story, and we are each and every week. Thank you again, Pastor Adam, for providing such great inspiration for us this morning again. And thank you for gathering here with us again. It's great throughout the summer months to, to have this opportunity that even if we're away, even if we're on vacation or far across the country or in another country, we can still worship together as the family of God. Oh, it may not be the same as gathering together in person in the sanctuary, but we can still gather, we can still worship and feel like we are at home with our home church. And that is why we say that you are a part of our church family and your worship here with us is so very, very important. Whether you make it in person ever or if it's just always online here together, we consider you a part of our family and are just so grateful that you take the time each week not just to worship with us but to worship our Heavenly Father together. For those of you that are continuing to support the ministry financially, thank you so much. We appreciate all that you are doing and all that you are helping the ministry of Lakeshore Church to continue on doing. If you want to donate to this ministry, there's information on the page right there in front of you. Go and click online anytime at all and just uh, help us out, help the ministry of God to continue to flow through St. Clair Shores and beyond as we continue to do His work and His will. Thanks again for being with us this morning. Don't forget to check out all the information about Lakeshore Church. Hit our website, lakeshorechurch.com. You can download the app. You can check out the podcast. You find us on Facebook, YouTube, all over the place. We are there just being there for you. And uh, there's so many opportunities to get involved and serve. Thanks for being a part of our worshiping community. Have a fantastic week.